about chest tubes. Chest tubes is very, very important, very, very critical for the NCLEX exam. So we're going to review it today just to make sure that, you know, we cover our basis so far as that particular um, topic is concerned. Many candidates struggle with the concept. Many people reach out. Hey, Dr. Boni and your team, Metcognito, please help us with chest tubes. And that is why today we are getting into it all about chest tubes. The first question you want to ask yourself is why chest tubes? Why chest tubes? Why do we use chest tubes? You know, this is a chest tube and I'm sure many of us have encountered it. We've seen it at the bedside of our patients. And when it comes to the NCLEX exam, we want to make sure that we understand the concept very well and know how well we are going to help, you know, our, our patients. You know, because we are talking about chest tubes, Usually, I want to take pick things from the ground up so that you are not confused about anything. So let's start from the basics. And we are not going to get into deep, deep anatomy and physiology. We are just going to go straight into what is necessary so that you can be able to ace anything which comes with chest tubes. So number one, because we are talking about chest tubes, that means we are talking about the chest, right? So to understand chest tubes, one thing I need you to always remember is pressures in the lungs. And when we are talking about chest tubes, we are talking about a tube which will fill the space. It is called the plural space. The plural space. The plural space. The plural space. Now, the interesting thing about this plural space is that there is pressure there. But the pressure of the plural space is a negative pressure negative pressure. So please, that's something, whenever you see chest tubes in your NCLEX, remember, negative pressure in the plural space. Now, some authorities say the pressure in there is about minus four, minus four. And that is what helps the lung to function because, you know, the lung is in this rib cage, right? And the negative pressure allows the lung to function properly when we breathe in. Now, if we say that that space, the plural space, is a negative pressure, then what changes the pressure? That means that for that negative pressure to change, something must occupy that pressure. So for that negative pressure to change, that means that something must occupy that space. Now, what are the things which can occupy that space? Because if we understand the things which can occupy that plural space, which is negative so far as pressure is concerned, then we can understand why we need to use the chest tube and how to handle the chest tube. So the space can be filled with fluid, regular plural fluid. We call that plural effusion. Now, in this space, there's some fluid there already, but that fluid is very limited, very little there can be situations which can cause an overproduction of that fluid. For example, if somebody has heart failure, okay? For example, if there is an infection going on, like pneumonia, people can develop some pleural effusion after an infection because of the inflammatory process. Number two, that space, that negative space, can also be changed if the place is occupied by a lot of air, and we call that pneumothorax, all right? And then that space, that pressure can change again. If the place is occupied by blood, we call that hemothorax. And then, in fact, that space can also be occupied by abscess. We call that empyema. And then there can also be you know, lung cancer, which can cause so many things. So these are some of the things which can occupy the space and cause the negative pressure in the plural space to change. Now, because naturally there's negative pressure, that is what allows the lung to function. As soon as that pressure changes, then we are in trouble. So since the negative pressure in the plural space can change, it then changes the dynamics of the work of the lungs. All right, and I'm going to explain how a patient will present if the negative pressure in the plural space changes. So 
if that negative pressure change is not so much, the patient may be asymptomatic. But remember, you are preparing for the NCLEX exam, and the exam is a board exam. So board exam will bring you a typical patient scenario. So if the negative pressure here changes by virtue of fluid, by virtue of blood, which we call hemothorax, maybe somebody was involved in motor vehicle accident, right? And then the chest was compressed or something. They can develop hemothorax. If that pressure changes, how will my client present? The client can present with shortness of breath. They can also present with chest pain when they are trying to breathe. And they can also present with shoulder pain. These are the things or these are the symptoms of a patient whose pressure, negative pressure in the pleural space has changed. Now, chest tubes are placed to restore the negative pressure in that intrapleural space. So that is why we are learning about chest tubes because with somebody who is, in, who is short of breath, look, that can be life-threatening. So we want to be very careful about that. So that is why when that negative pressure in the pleural space changes, then we want to put in a chest tube so that it can release some of the pressure and then that negative pressure can come back again. So this is basically a chest tube. This is how a chest tube looks like. But we are going to look at a chest tube in the context of, you know, how the exam really wants us to approach it. Now, the chest tube has three chambers, and this is something I really want you to write in your notebook. Three chambers, three, three different chambers. We have one we call the collection chamber. So I call it CWS, the three chambers of the chest tube. CWS, the collecting chamber, because we said that we need to recreate that negative pressure in the plural space. So the collection chamber. And then we also have what we call the water seal and then the suction. And I'm going to take my time to talk about all these three chambers of the chest tube. In fact, we have chest tubes which have just one chamber. We have chest tubes which have two chambers. But the most common one, which you will see in your nursing practice, is the chest tube with the three chambers. CWS, the collection chamber, the water seal, and the suction. Okay, so let's get into it. What are the functions of these three components of the chest tube? The collection chamber, the water seal, and the suction. Okay, so number one, the collection chamber. The collection chamber, the function of it is that it collects, the name even speaks for itself. It collects whatever, whether it is pus, whether it is air, whether it is blood, whether it is, you know, pleural fluid, which is overproduced. It collects that into the chest tube. And there are various marks there. And the marks indicate the amount of, um, the amount of, stuff which has been collected from that plural space. So, for example, if it is very little, it may just be 10 mils. But if it goes on and on and on, it can come as much as 2,000 mils. That's two liters. And that means that that patient is really struggling. Okay? Number two, we also have the middle chamber, which is um, the, 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 the water seal chamber. The water seal chamber, what it does is that it allows air to leave the pleural space, but it does not allow air to come back into it. So air can come from the patient into the system and leave, but air, the, the system, the water, that water chamber, that water seal chamber will not allow the air to go back. And we will see why it is important. Okay. Another thing you also need to know for your NCLEX exam is that that water chamber oscillates when we say oscillate, it moves up and down. As the patient is breathing in, you know, it moves up and down. And when it moves up and down like that, it helps me to know that, okay, the patient is breathing. As soon as that movement stops, there may be a problem. And then the suction, the suction, the suction, it allows, you know, it's a sucking, right? Because we're talking about the negative pressure in the pleural space. So that is why I really took time to explain why we need that negative pressure. So the suction 
it helps to try to restore that negative pressure, which was lost because maybe pus was produced, because blood was produced, because air, excessive air was produced in case of a pneumothorax. So how will I know that the suction is working? The way I will know that the suction is working is that I will see bubbling, 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 bubbling in the, in the, in the suction pump, in the suction pump. That is what is going to help me to know that, oh, okay, the suction is working. So, number one, we look at the, um, the collection chamber. It helps me to know how much fluid or how much blood or how much pus has been collected. Then we have the water seal. It allows um, the, the stuff to come out of the, um, of, the, of the patient, but it does not allow air to go back. And then we also have the suction, which helps to recreate that negative pressure which should be in the plural space. Now, there are two types of chest tubes so far as um, the systems are concerned. We have what we call the wet chest tube and we have what we call the dry chest tube. The wet chest tube is what we've been discussing because it has a water um, um, component to it. The dry chest tube, they create that um, negative pressure in the plural space by adjusting a knob. So that one is just adjusting a knob to withdraw the, the, the pressure so that the negative pressure in the plural space can come back again. So with the dry chest tube, you are not expecting any bubbling. With the wet chest tube, you're expecting bubbling. Again, the typical chest tube, which we see in many of our hospitals, has three components. Can somebody remind me of them? I need somebody, I need one person, whether Dr. Ama, Dr. Cecilia, um, um, Ama, Hannah, you know, um, um, Mary, Nanaya, um, Prince, anyone can just tell me what are the three components of the chest tube and what are their functions? Yeah, you said we've got three components. Yeah. So the first one is the collecting chambers. Mm -hmm. That one will help us to know how much fluid has been collected. Beautiful. Then you see the second one is the uh, water seal chamber. Yes. You said that one will allow air to leave the pleural space, space. Mm -hmm. and you said something about it oscillating as yes. well. Yes. Then you said the third uh, one is the suction control, yeah. which restores the negative pressure in the Beautiful. chamber. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And then what are the two types we have in terms of wet and dry? And what's the difference between wet and dry? Yeah, you Anna. said the wet one is the one we've been discussing. Yeah. Uh, then the dry one, you said it has something to do with adjusting the knob, that there is no bubbling involved in that one, beautiful. that the only thing is to adjust. And by the time the uh, knob is being adjusted, then the air will leave. It's as if we are controlling the negative pressure just to restore the neg negative pressure in the place. Beautiful, beautiful. Chest tubes made ridiculously simple. So now, this is where we come in, so far as our NCLEX is concerned. So what is the nursing management of a client with a chest tube inserted? Because this is what you must know, right? You are preparing for your NCLEX, you must know. So, when you have a patient with a chest tube, one thing you need to know is to secure the chest tube. That chest tube must be secured. Number two, the collection apparatus must be below the level of the chest. So please, that is very critical. If the patient is lying on the bed, that's, that chest tube, the, the whole system, it must be lower. The reason is because so that it can allow gravity, okay, to help it so that the, this, the, 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 whatever is being drained, whether blood, whether water, whether pus can go into the chest tube. Number three, you've got to do everything to make sure that there is no kinking of the tube because we are trying to maintain that negative pressure in the chest, right? So you want to make sure that there's no kinking because as long as there's a kinking in the tube, we are in trouble. And that can really, really cause much damage to the patient. So secure the chest tube, make sure that the collection system is lower than the chest so that gravity can help it and then avoid kinking of the tube. How, okay, how should, um, what is kinking? Okay, good. So kinking is basically, um, let me, let me, let me take this wire, for example. 
please can you see this wire this wire frame good it's like you know the way things can fold on their on on themselves and kink that's what you call kinking it will just kink like that right like if you they, 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 because it's just tube it's it's a tube right so you want to avoid it's folding on itself because it affects the pressure which you are trying to generate in the in the lung that's negative pressure basically so how often should chest tubes be monitored if a patient's on a chest tube? The authorities usually talk about one beautiful Dr. Prince and uh, Mr. Prince. Beautiful, awesome. So the authorities usually talk about monitoring chest tubes for one to four hours. Some say you have to monitor the patient every one hour. Some also say every four hours. So in your NCLEX exam, please watch out. One to four hours should be the sweet spot. If I am a careful nurse, I want to monitor that patient every one hour, right? Just monitor it, make sure that there's nothing going wrong. It is oscillating, everything is moving on very well. Now, what should cause a nursing team member to report about a chest tube? Like, what should cause you, if you're on the ward, what should cause you to say that, mm, this chest tube, there's something wrong, therefore I have to do something about it, number one. Typically, Unless it is hemothorax, unless it is blood you are really draining. If it is pleural fluid, pleural fluid should not have blood. At best, maybe a tinge of blood. As soon as the chest tube you are using to drain, you start seeing bright red blood. Alarm, you know, it must, I need to tell somebody. I need to call the doctor to come and see. Number two. Maybe you are draining the thing and all of a sudden there's a sudden increase in the amount of fluid which is coming or the amount of blood which is coming. No, that's not a good thing. You want to also um, let you know the, the entire team know, especially call the doctor to come and see. And number three, if there's persistent and consistent drainage, which is more than 100 mils an hour, man, we are in trouble. Then I want the, doc the doctor to come and really assess the patient quickly. So these are three things that when I see as a nurse, no, somebody needs to attend to this patient. I'm not going to joke with it. I'm going to get somebody to come and assess this patient right away. So number one, if there is bright red blood, boom, I need to get somebody to come and see the patient. Number two, sudden increase in the drainage. Not good. Number three, persistent and constant drainage, more than 100 mils per hour. I need to get somebody come and see the patient all right good so the question is very simple what if the water seal stops to oscillate so somebody may be asking me what do you mean by oscillation this is what is happening this is oscillation because are you seeing it as a patient is breathing in and out you see this is it this is this is this is all that oscillation is all about so those who are asking about oscillation and then those who are asking about kinking kinking is when this tube Tense on itself. When it's tense on itself. So what if the water seal chamber stops doing what it is doing? What if it stops, you know, oscillating? If the tube is fluctuating or oscillating, it means that the tube is patent. So if I if I have a patient who has a chest tube and I keep seeing this, that means that the tube is patent, right? If the tube stops moving like that, you know, this, 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 if it stops doing that. It means one of few things. Number one, it may mean that the tube is obstructed. Number two, it may also mean that the tube has looped or rolled on itself. Number three, it may also mean that the tube has kinked. That's what I was talking about initially. Or it may be that that negative pressure, which was supposed to be in the pleural space, has been restored, and therefore that tube has to, the chest tube must come out. So you must know for your MCQ, for the NCLEX, what are the things which would tell me that, you know, if the, 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 the oscillation stops, what are the things which should come into my mind? Either the tube is obstructed, the tube has looped, the tube has kinked, or the lung expansion is back to the negative pressure it should be, and therefore the chest tube must come out. As soon as you see that, you want to document and get someone to come and assess the patient. You also want to watch and see if there's any kinking, any obstruction, you know, after you've seen, you've watched all those things and there's nothing, 
you want to call the doctor to come and see that, look, the thing is not oscillating anymore. And so what can we do about it? All right, beautiful. So remember that I talked about bubbling and this is what I, this is the example of the bubbling. So please see it very well. It is bubbling. In reality, you don't want, you know, the chest tube to be bubbling too quickly. If you see bubbling, which looks like jacuzzi, you are in trouble, right? You know, the way you are relaxing your jacuzzi and then there's water coming. That is, that is not very good. If there's continuous bubbling, think about air leakage in the chest tube system. So if you have chest tube system with continuous bubbling, think about air leakage. If there's air leakage, you want to correct it right away. But if you check the whole system and there is no leakage, then please, you need to call a doctor right away. Now, if the patient is having intermittent bubbling, especially in the patient who has pneumothorax, like when there's air in that pleural space, well, it means that the air is being suctioned and that is intermittent. But if it is so continuous, like that, no, 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 no. That means there's a leakage in the system, okay? And the pleural space and proper tube function continue to monitor. So if you have a patient who has a pneumothorax, and you start seeing some bubbling intermittently, that is good because that means that the pneumothorax is being cleared. But if it is regular pleural effusion and then you see too much bubbling, too much bubbling should tell me that, no, there's something wrong with the tube or the system. The system itself is leaking. Okay. I want somebody to just, you know, summarize some of the points we've, we've made so, so far. No, I said it should have intermittent bubbling, not continuous erratic bubbling. If there's continuous erratic bubbling, then that means maybe there's a problem. Okay, Prince, yeah. Okay, so can somebody summarize the significance of bubbling, the significance of the, um, the oscillation and do, those things? And then when will I call somebody to come and see the patient after a chest tube is inserted? What are some of the three things I want to see that will cause me to call somebody. I want somebody to volunteer. Anyone? 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 You see, uh, continuous drainage more than 100 ml per hour continuously. Mm -hmm. Sudden increase in the drainage is also a red flag. Mm -hmm. And the bright red blood, to win if it's, if yeah. it's not, a, if, it, if it's air, he must tell us, right? Yeah. The danger, yeah. Okay, so what what about what's the significance of the oscillation? This one, yeah, what is, yeah. What's the significance of that? It means that the patient is breathing, is working as it's supposed to. Beautiful. If you stop them, something is wrong. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. I'm happy that we are picking it up. So, what are the things not to do with chest tubes? What are some of the things you should not do? Some nurses do it but it is not advisable to do. What are some of the things? Number one, do not milk or strip the chest tube to aid drainage. And I want to show you, you know, at times some people will go like, oh, I want to press it so that the, 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 the blood in the tube can go down. No, don't do that. Don't milk it, okay? Don't milk it. Allow the thing to flow with the help of gravity. Number two, don't clamp it on your own unless you have orders from the doctor to do so. All right. And um, number three, while you are transporting the patient or the patient is in motion, don't clip it. Don't clamp it. So number one, don't milk it. Number two, don't clamp it unless you've been instructed or given the order by a physician. And number three, when the patient is in transit, don't clamp it. So these are some of the things you don't have to do with a chest tube. Now, what if the drainage system of the chest tube breaks? What would you do? What if the drainage system breaks? If the drainage system breaks, then quickly you want to clamp the chest tube quickly and then insert the tube into sterile water bottle to reestablish the underwater seal. Remember the three components of the chest tube? We said the collection chamber, the water seal, and then the 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 suction, right? So if 
the test tube system breaks, you want to pick the tube quickly and put it in an underwater seal drainage. The reason is because you don't want air to start going into the pleural space again. Because if the patient breathes in, the patient will suck air from the outside. Right? So as soon as the system breaks, you want to put the tube underwater so that it does not suck air and cause trouble for the patient. Number three, call the doctor to reconnect the remaining drainage system to a new chest tube. So these are the steps. If the system breaks, clamp it, put the tube underwater, and then call the doctor to come and you know, reconnect quickly. Now, what to do in case there's accidental pulling out of the chest tube? So, you know, maybe the patient was asleep and the patient was stretching and, ah, and then, you know, it comes out. Don't forget that that negative pressure, we want to, we want to, we want to do something about it. And if the, the chest tube has been there, so that means it's created a hole and the patient gets it out, that's the patient can be sucking in air, right? So if you are the nurse on duty and that happens, what should you do? Quickly, use your gloved hand, not, not your bare hand, your gloved hand. Put pressure on that area and then call for occlusive dressing using petroleum gauze, all right? Um, if you don't have petroleum um, gel there, then you want to use dry sterile gauze, but quickly, and then use adhesive tape. Now, the issue is that cover the thing in three areas, and I'm going to show you a picture. I'm going to draw a picture for you. So you have the patient, this is the patient's lungs, okay? And then th th there's a chest tube and the chest tube has come out. So you have to make sure that you put occlusive dressing, which is going to cover the thing in three areas. Number one, number two, number three. One, two, three. And then this area must be left open. Why? Because um, when the patient is breathing in, Okay, it will too close. And when they are breathing out, you want the air to leave or you want whatever drainage is there to leave. You don't want to cover that area with a complete um, uh, bandage. It is wrong, right? You want to use a three-way dressing, three-way dressing, three-way dressing, so that the air can leave the air, this place. That is all. So if the chest tube comes out quickly, Cover the area with um, your gloved hand. Number two, apply occlusive dressing using petrolatum gauze. Number three, tape it in three places so that it can still allow air and you know stuff to leave and notify the doctor right away. Notify the doctor right away. Now, what about clamping? Because you remember we said you can clamp but clamp with the order of the doctor and don't clamp when the patient is in transition. So if you want to clamp a chest tube cord, number one, clamp with a cord, um, clamp with a clamp which has rubber so that it does not cut the chest tube. And number two, unless otherwise stated by the physician or by hospital policy, do not clamp the chest tube for more than 15 seconds. So, you know, I'm dropping some numbers. I said the plural, the negative plural pressure is minus four, minus four. I said it should not drain more than 100 mils per hour. It should cause you to be alarmed. And you should not clamp it for more than 15 seconds. Please write it down. More than 15 seconds. 15 seconds. Okay. Now, one other interesting thing is that chest tubes can also be placed after the cardiac surgeries to drain blood from the thoracic cavity and around the heart. So chest tubes are not just for chylothorax, hemothorax, pneumothorax, you know, uh, and pyema and all that. It can also, you know, be placed after cardiac surgeries so that excess blood can be drained. Now, let's get in and try some questions, okay? Let's try some questions. Okay, so I want a volunteer to read a question for us. Let's try some questions because what's the point gathering all the information and not being able to answer a question? Can somebody just unmute and, and read? Yeah. 
That's beautiful. What is the prioritized sequence of action the nurse should take upon entering the client's room after finding that the chest tube has been disconnected from the closed drainage system and has fallen into on the onto the floor while the client attempt to get out of bed, out of the bed unassisted? Mm -hmm. So oh, want me to answer it too? Okay. You, you can answer it or if anyone wants to answer it or anyone oh. wants to type the answer, that's also fine. So what's the mm -hmm. prioritized sequence? So we are looking at your nursing prioritization. Prioritization. If you go in there, patient um, chest tube has been disconnected and it's falling onto the floor. What are you going to do? Because, hey, put it on the sterile water that not allow the negative air back mm -hmm. to uh, evaluate the client's breathing condition. That would be number two for me. Number three, monitor the or oh, prepare. Number three will be oh number three will be monitor the client and four will be prepare the connect to connect another chest tube. Okay. So so which I know one and two I'm starting but three and four I'm not. Okay, so tell me which are you going A, B, C, D? Are you going A, C, B, D? Everyone type your answer. What is your okay. prioritization? Okay. You, you go into a client's room, chest tube has come out. What, okay. what is your prioritization? What will you do? A, B, what will you do? A. Everybody type. Are you going to go A, B, C, D? Are you going to go A, C, B, D? Are you going to go A, D, B, C? I, what will you do? What did you do? So let me see. Mr. Prince says A C D B. A C D B. So that means Mr. Prince is going to immerse the tube in sterile water, then C. Evaluate the client's breathing condition, then B. Prepare the and connect a fresh closed chest drainage system. Then D is monitor the client's pulse and blood pressure. So what's the correct answer? The correct answer is A C. B D. That is it. A C B D. Not A C D B. A C B D. What do I mean by that? A C. So you go in. You remember, we said we don't want the client to be sucking air from outside. So as soon as I go and I see that this client is sleeping, old man, he has a chest tube in, and he did not know the chest tube has come out, and the chest tube is out. First, I will pick the chest tube tip and I'll put it under water. Quick one. That's the first thing. Number two, as soon as I do that, I need to monitor how is the breathing. Is the patient in respiratory distress, right? Then, you know, we need to then prepare and connect a fresh closed chest drainage system. Because remember, if there's a chest tube and I put it underwater, that's the main thing I want to do so that he's not sucking air. After that, I want to monitor the respiratory rate to make sure he's not in respiratory distress. Then, I want to get a new chest tube and just make sure it is connected or call the doctor to connect it. And then I can go and check the patient's pulse and blood pressure. Because don't forget, checking the patient's pulse, you have to stand there and count, right? And checking the blood pressure, you have to now go and get a, a blood pressure monitor. So please, if you go into a room, chest tube has come out of the patient and you know the patient is like the chest tube came out of the system and it is dangling and the first thing pick the tip put it under sterile water that's number one number two check the respiratory rate how are you doing you know check the patient's breathing condition then get a new chest tube attach it and then after that you go on to check the rest of the vitals is that we all okay are we all okay and the, the, the point is, the teaching point is this. The nurse's primary action is to immerse the tube in sterile water or saline to restore that underwater seal. Because remember, the chest tube has come off and those three components, the, uh, the, 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 the sea, the underwater seal, and then the, the suction, right? So the underwater seal is broken. So you want to put it there quickly. And this is done to prevent air from entering the pleural space and causing pneumothorax. Then, point two, the nurse assesses the client's respiratory status for signs of pneumothorax. Because 
you don't know how long that thing has been there. And you don't know when the patient has been sucking in air. And if there's severe pneumothorax, it can kill the patient, right? And then you then put in a new closed chest tube drainage. Then finally, the nurse obtains the patient's vital signs and reports the incident to the healthcare provider. That these are the this is the sequence. Please, does it make sense now? Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Let's try the second one. Hannah, please, can you read the second case for us? Hannah, Hannah has been participating so well. Please, can you read the second case for me, please? What should be the nurse's next course of action upon observing persistent bubbling in the suction control chamber of the closed chest drainage system following the insertion of the chest tube? Okay. What should you do? Uh, record hmm. the observation, maintain ongoing monitoring, bubbling, refill the suction control chamber with water, no. Drain excess water from the suction control chamber, increase the suction level. Bubbling. Uh, is is bubbling this? wrong? Is bubbling wrong at all? If there's some bubbling, is it wrong? Yeah, it is wrong because it is persistent. Okay. No, so, bubbling what, should not be long. Too much bubbling persistence. Exactly. If it is too much, right? Is it, what should the nurse's next course of action be upon observing persistent bubbling in the suction control chamber of the closed chest tube drainage following the insertion? Like as soon as you insert it, you see some bubbling coming out. What would you do? Will you refill the suction, Hannah? No, I'll just record the observation and maintain the ongoing monitoring of the bubbling. Beautiful. Since That's it's okay. okay. That is it. That's how we do it. That's how we do it. Some bubbling is, is allowed, but if it is persistent and, you know, like jacuzzi, then we are in trouble, right? And then the teaching point is that the nurse must record this typical observation and sustain monitoring. Adjusting fluid levels depends on the level of the fluid, not the bubbling caused by the suction, okay? And it is not advisable for the nurse to increase suction as the gentle bubbling signifies proper operation. And then elevation suction could accelerate, elevating suction could accelerate water evaporation from the chamber and you don't want that, okay? So just record it and observe and just mo keep monitoring the patient. Okay, La uh, another question. Today I want us to kill, like kill the whole, you know, chest tube thing. Chest tube should not cause us grief and stress again. We should be able to get in there and be able to know that I can ace every question on chest tube. I want someone else to read this for us. Anyone? During a routine chest tube assessment, the nurse observed continuous bubbling in the water seal chamber of the closed chest drainage system. What inference should the nurse make based on this observation? Mm -hmm. It means that an air leak is present within the system. A fresh nurse. So as I see, match the was some sharing it is configured the connection of the drainage to where it's a secret thing. The answer is B. <laughs> Hannah has killed it. She's killed it. An air leak is present within the system. That's the essence of bubbling. So, teaching point continuous bubbling in the water seal chamber typically suggests a leak or loose connection in the system, leading to continuous suction of air into the closed chest drainage system. While a new large pneumothorax could cause rapid bubbling, it's less probable, okay? And increasing suction on the wall unit would intensify bubbling in the suction control chamber, not the water seal chamber. And over tight tapping of connections is not a primary concern. So Hannah was right. An air leak is present within the system. So, okay, let's deal with this last question. Who read for us? I've really enjoyed this, seriously. What should the nurse do around 12.30 p.m. when the client is scheduled for the removal of the chest tube at 1 p.m.? Yeah, so you have a patient, a client whose chest tube has to come out at 1 p.m. and you just took handing over and it's 12.30. Is there something you need to do? Uh, I will choose B. I don't know how painful the, the condition, but that's to give the patients comfort while removing it. I think B. 
Does anyone have a different answer? Does anyone have a different answer? Mary says C. Taran says C. Confirm the availability of a suture removal set and dressing materials. Well, if you don't have that, why would you even remove it? But I think the answer is B. The answer is B. The reason is because the client ought to receive pre-medication about 30 minutes before the chest tube removal if there's a prescription for analgesia and if the medication can be administered at a time. So before you remove the chest tube, you must make sure that the patient has gotten some pre-medication, okay? So the patient is not, because the chest tube is big and you don't want to pull that and the patient is in pain. Ouch, 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 no. It's forced under the healthcare provider's jurisdiction to ascertain the outcomes of the daily chest x-ray. While acquiring equipment for chest tube removal is essential, this task isn't restricted to the indicated time frame. So you can get the materials at any time. It's not, but the, the analgesia must be given so that the patient can, you know, be rest assured that he's not going to be in pain when the chest tube is being removed, okay? And then similarly, while explaining the procedure to your client is crucial, it can be conducted either earlier or later than the specified time frame. So when you have like a time frame like that in your NCLEX, you want to really be sure what is it in my answer stem that is time sensitive. That's all that the question is about.